Thank you. Psalm 110, a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends out from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your foes. Your people will offer themselves willingly on the day you lead your forces on the holy mountains. From the womb of the morning, like dew, your youth will come to you. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations. Filling them with corpses, he will shatter heads over the wide earth. He will drink from the stream by the path. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Amen. Let's all stand and sing Emmanuel. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, his name is called Emmanuel, God with us, revealed in us, his name is called Emmanuel. Emmanuel. It's a great day to be together, to worship, to visit, to fellowship, and to prepare for uh, the Christmas time when we welcome the birth of Jesus. If you are visiting with us for the first time, please take your bulletin and fill out the card and drop it in the offering plate when it comes by. We'd love to hear from you and know more about you. If you're watching with us on Facebook Live, we welcome you. We would love to see you in person. Come back and join us and enjoy this beautiful setting with the decorations and the holiday spirit that's here inside our sanctuary. We are glad that you are worshiping with us. So let's continue with Carol of Advent, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Let's stand and sing, please.
The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. I will lie, lie down, down in peace, sleep peace. in peace. For you, For you alone, alone, O Lord, Lord make, make me dwell in safety. safety. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory, Glory to God in the highest, and, and on peace, earth peace, peace to men on whom his favor rests. from Isaiah this morning, verses, um, chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders and the rod of their oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Please sing with me, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. Let's pray together this morning. Father, as we come before you this morning, we come with heavy hearts, we come with grateful hearts, but most of all, Father, we come with humble hearts. Lord, we are so thankful for the hope and the peace of this season. We are so thankful for the gift of your Son. We pray, God, that you would be with the many needs of our church, with the many needs of the people of our church, Lord. You know each and every one of those, and Lord, may each of us make the commitment to pray for each and every one of those needs every time we come before you. Lord, may you give us each a heart of Christmas, not of the presence, not of the commercialization, but Lord God, of, the, of the, the heart of which you sent your son as a child to grow and live among us on this earth, to be sent to the cross that we may know everlasting life. Lord God, I pray that you be with this service, that you open our hearts and minds, to what Dr. Gentry has, what you have given Dr. Gentry to give to us. Lord God, just be with each and every one of us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
This time I'm reading from the New Testament, Matthew chapter 11, verse 3. Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? And Matthew 22, 41 through 46. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the spirit calls him Lord saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. This is the word of the Lord. Becky, I forgot this. Is all this water for me? Okay, because I'm, I'm, I'm almost drunk all of it, so. Makes me think of Snoopy, right? Does anybody know that? When, when the peanuts, when, uh, who is it that faints? And Charlie Brown says, Snoopy will get some water, and he runs and gets water, and he drinks it right in front of the girl that's fainting. <laughs> Uh, while I'm thinking of it, I wanted to give just a short plug for the our global mission offering. Um, I took a group of students yesterday to help Sasha and Mira in their food pantry distribution. They do every Saturday in uh, South St. Louis, and it's always a good mission trip, service project trip for students. And um, so that they're supported by this offering. So that's all I'll say. Just don't forget giving through the between now and the end of the year. During these Sundays of Advent, we're looking at the what's often referred to as the throne names from Isaiah 9-6 that were applied to Jesus by early Christians and, and also made famous centuries later by Frederick Handel and his Messiah. And last week we looked at Wonderful Counselor and today we're looking at the title Mighty God. 
And when applied to Jesus, the term mighty God has been a sticking point for a long time for many folks when they consider Christianity. Christianity has long referred to Jesus as God in the flesh, the incarnation. And most, uh, most Christians, it's probably fair to say, are Trinitarians, believing in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Although not all Christians, uh, but most of them. And um, three in one, the Trinity. And those of us who are familiar with the faith may forget how much of a struggle believing Jesus as the Son of God may be for a lot of people. For the Jews, for example, the second commandment is hugely important. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. How can a human being be God? Wouldn't that be a violation of the second commandment? Shouldn't we be careful in whom or what we call God? Which is an important question, I think. So when you read much of the New Testament, you can imagine how so many of the Jewish folks struggle with this notion of the divinity of Jesus. Same is true with our Muslim friends who have a similar perspective as the Jewish faith. Islam embraces radical monotheism. The, the Shahada, the call to prayer every day, proclaims there's only one God and Muhammad is his prophet. And our Muslim friends believe very much in Jesus as a prophet and honor him as such but reject any notion of the divinity of Jesus or the idea that Jesus can forgive sins. For them, that's blasphemy. Only God can do that. And when thinking about other religions, um, in thinking about the incarnation, I'm always surprised to think that the divinity of Christ gives us a lot of common ground with our Hindu friends, even though we, you know, we often don't have a lot of co common ground with them. Hindu has millions of, of gods, several of them more popular than others and often localized deities. But Hindus will tell you that the God they worship is just a path to the divine, a conduit to the one true creator of all things. And so Christianity re reveals that Jesus likewise certainly is a path to the divine, but Christians would say he's the one who reveals the complete fullness of God, the complete fullness of the creator in one life, in one human life. So looking back at Isaiah, the term mighty God is a royal title, and we have to consider what does this have to do with the rulers of Israel, the title of kingship. In the ancient world, kings were often deities or demigods before the people, like the pharaohs of Egypt, and believed to represent the people before God. And the king of Jerusalem would not have been considered a deity, but was the direct gift of God to the people where God had invested divine power. And you see this story of the monarchy of Israel. The people cried out for a king in the book of, of Samuel. And, and God gives them a king who helps deliver them from the Philistines and other enemies. But first he's Saul who doesn't work out so well. And so then God replaces Saul with David and gives the people a new dynasty that is to last for generations. So the idea, the ideal king of Israel would be led by God who would be successful as a warrior king, but also in economics and agriculture and establishing justice throughout the land. The king of Israel may not have been a deity, but the king did have a priestly role. When David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, they made sacri a sacrifice every six steps of the way. When Solomon himself offered sacrifice in the temple, when the temple was commissioned. And so Israel, like other nations at the time, believed that the king was a representative of God between God and the people. But the, in the Israelite tradition, the king was also defender of the poor, the needy, and the oppressed. The king's role may have been celebrated, but the king was only an instrument of God who uses the term king to do wondrous things, which also makes us think of the wonderful counselor from last week. The king of Israel was believed to be a gift from God and connected to the divine. And this begins with the idealistic and hopeful expectation of, a, of birth, of looking for a new king, one to deliver as Isaiah says, for unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. It's easy to get bogged down with these titles, 
and neglect the context of the passage. Even in this same verse, in verse 6, For unto us a child has been born, a son given to us. It's about the birth of a child, the hopeful expectation of a new baby, and then ultimately a new king. Martin Luther, just a few years ago in 1531, in his Christmas message, said, It's like when women approach a baby's cradle and say, Oh, a baby! What is it? And I answer, It's a boy, and he's ours! What an incredible thing to say! That all of us should somehow be the mothers of whom we have not carried in our womb. Talking about Jesus. He is given to us as though he were our own, our own son. How proud and honored we are that he is our son, that he belongs to us. But it is not enough that he is born to us. He is also given to us. What does given mean? He is a pure gift, a present. And there is nothing I have to give or pay in return. Thus the child born was a gift of God's grace to us, according to Luther. So who among us has witnessed a birth? Can you remember the first time you met a new family member? A son, a daughter, a niece, a nephew, a grandchild, or someone else? My father shared my own birth story with me a few times. He said that mama had been in labor for some time through the night, and it was like 5 a.m., so he just had to sneak out and get a cup of coffee. And when he came back, there I was. And I guess I've been sneaking up on people ever since. <laughs> Becky and I experienced the gift of a child only one time. And yes, I do remember it. Becky was on medication. And she remembers saying, well, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> but I was a witness to my own daughter's birth. And I can't really describe the feeling of emotion both wonder and terrifying. You really now are a daddy, you are a father, what are you gonna do about it? How is your life gonna change now? And as parents, we have expectations of what we want our child to be, a great athlete, a, a provider, wealthy, a leader, compassionate, a teacher, educator, scientist, thinker, uh, economic person, whatever. Uh, a military leader, but the wisdom of great parenting is that we have to let our child be whom they feel that they are at the end of the day. We have to give them the grace to do that. And from Becky and myself, we are proud to have a rock and roller in the family. I have heard more than one testimony from several of my male friends from Alabama feeling the pressure to grow up to be a football player. I mean, can you imagine that? If you watch the SEC championship, you can never imagine parents wanting their sons to be football players in Alabama, right? But I remember a friend of mine saying that it, he was so traumatized to tell his daddy, Daddy, I really want to play in the band. And the grace of a father to say, that's fine, son. You be the best tuba player, piccolo player, whatever instrument you pick up, you be the best you can be. And I'll support you all the way. What grace that requires, whatever it is. Likewise, there were messianic expectations of what a king was supposed to be like, but Jesus didn't always live up to that. Jesus didn't always live up to messianic expectations. In the Synoptic Gospels, there's what we call the Messianic Secret, where Peter and others will say, well, we believe you're the Christ, or some miracle will lead people to say, this is the Christ. And Jesus is like, shh, don't tell anybody about it, okay? Keep this under your hat. And I've always wondered, is that like how we really keep secrets? We say we will and we really won't in human nature. Or is it really, you know, it's dangerous times when Roman rule and Messiah talk, or maybe it's both, I don't know. But we have to let the Gospels reveal Jesus as he is, the nature of this kingship, even in this term, mighty God, from Isaiah. At the conclusion of the blessing of the loaves and the fish story from John chapter 6, Jesus realized that they were going to come about and take him by force to make him king. And so Jesus withdraws again to the mountain by himself. That's not his role, that's not his intention. 
The nature of Jesus' deity is unlike that of political royalty. Jesus rejected the political nature of kingship again and again. And there were many revolutionary and many messiahs that came before and after Jesus. The Gospel of John makes the case more direct, really. The I am statements of John, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the vine. That's seven if you counted them, right? Before Pontius Pilate, Jesus answered him when Pilate suggested that he was a king. Jesus replied, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over, but as it is, my kingdom is not from here. If you are slow to embrace the nature of Jesus in this way, you're actually in good company. Matthew presents us with two examples. The one is from John the Baptist in Matthew 11, where Anne read the, the verse. The great prophet and preacher in the wilderness, baptizer of Jesus, was imprisoned for publicly criticizing King Herod Antipas' relationship with his brother's wife. And Herod did not take public criticism from prophets too well. And so John's disciples must have come to, to John the Baptist and told him of the activity of Jesus and his own disciples. And it seemed a little bit different. They didn't baptize like John did, for one thing. And so John is sitting in prison day after day, scratching his head because... Maybe Jesus didn't answer all of his questions and meet all of his expectations. So he sends out this word to the, through his disciples to Jesus. Are you the one? Are you the one? Are we to wait for another one? Jesus' reply did not really answer John directly. Go tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor have the good news brought to him, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. People had various messianic expectations, but Jesus proclaimed himself as a healer. And no one really expected that kind of Messiah. John the Baptist had to come terms with that regarding Jesus. And Jesus, not giving the exact theological answer to John's disciples, but he gave more of a show-me kind of answer, basically saying, look and see what's happening. Come and see for yourself. The time of salvation has come. Participate in it yourself to see. After Jesus' response, answering John the Baptist, he continued to affirm John and proclaim that he was Elijah to come. And if John was Elijah, Jesus was inviting his audience to consider that he was the one. We see this echoed in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, where Philip says to Nathaniel, hey, we found the Messiah. And, and Nathaniel's like, where's he from? Philip's like, he's from Nazareth. He's like, Nazareth? What good has come from there? And Philip's, come and see for yourself. Come and see for yourself. The second example from Matthew of considering Jesus' divine nature is from this text that Anne read for, for us in chapter 22, where Jesus had been interrogated continually by this group of Pharisees. And Jesus responded with his own question after, this, after many, dealing with many other questions from the Pharisees there, from Psalm 110. And Jesus quoted from Psalm 110, which is interesting, that this psalm or this verse from Psalm 110 is more quoted or alluded to in the New Testament than any other verse in the Old Testament. It's also referred to in the Apostles' Creed that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. We Baptists don't require or acknowledge the affirmation of creeds, but we do must acknowledge that a lot of our Christian folks do and have for a long time. So that does make it important to note. The Pharisees were silent because they were forced to consider by Jesus that the Messiah would come in real time. And when this did occur, the Messiah would be greater than David. 
And at first, at, at first, the verse seems to be a paradox, but the Messiah greater than David would also be a descendant of David. And even more importantly, just as the kings of Israel were considered to be gifts of God, behold, a child, the Messiah, would also be God's son. And this is echoed back in Matthew from the very voice of God at Jesus' baptism. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. So in these two instances from Matthew, Jesus confronted different expectations of what it meant to be Messiah. He was not hedging on the answers, but pushing his questioners to consider the authentic reality of what they were facing. Christianity at its best is invitational. You know, we always give an, a response hymn. It invites people to respond. The faith invites others to discover what God is doing through Jesus and through the world today. And the best way to discover Jesus is to check out the claims for yourself. Have you ever considered the name Jesus Christ? If you travel back to the first century, you would not be able to find Jesus Christ by looking uh, the name up under the C's in the phone directory. But it, no one has phone directories anymore. I still use mine, but I still keep it in my desk, but not as much as I used to. We often mistakenly refer to the name Jesus Christ as a normal name, but in reality, the name Jesus Christ is a confession of faith. Jesus means Savior in the Hebrew, basically the same name as Joshua, the same meaning. Christ means the anointed one from the Greek, and from the name, the Jewish perspective and the Greek Gentile perspective, Jesus Christ, Savior of the world. For all people, to say Jesus Christ is a profession of faith in the Messiah. The basic confession of Christianity is that in Christ we encounter the fullness of God, and yet Jesus was fully human. And yes, it's the paradox, right? The contradiction of things that, that's beyond logic. Yes, we wonder and marvel at this, but there is great irony, at least for me, in this revelation. The fullness of God has shown us also through Jesus what it means to be human to be fully alive, to be fully alive for God. And this for me is what it means to follow Jesus. We are not called to be someone else, but we are called to be live out the me and the you that you are into what God has created us to be from what God has made us. One of the most beautiful things about Christianity is that it's so ancient and so diverse there are so many ways to connect on it. There's the life of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, thinking about what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah, the mystical side of Christianity, if you're interested in those things. And I think wherever you find interest or appeal and you grab a hold of that, it just kind of keeps pulling you into the faith. One of the last stories in the Gospel of John is the story of the disciple Thomas, who was absent in the first resurrection appearance of Jesus. And Thomas said to his fellow disciples that he would not believe in this resurrection unless, they could unless Jesus could show him his hands and his feet. You know, Thomas was from Missouri, right? You gotta show me. And then Jesus appeared to him in Thomas' famous confession, my Lord and my God. The gospels present Jesus as the master of the sea and of demons, he brought calm to the storms and to the demon possessed. And as the creator brought order to, as the creator brought order to chaos in the creation, and the power was from the creator and not from the power of the Roman Empire. Jesus extended the same power to his followers and to be about the work of creation and drawing people back to God, which kind of brings me to conclusion. Coming back to think about the second Sunday of Advent, which is themed about peace. Peace may seem to be a hard word to grasp when you're in a tough, dark time. But as Desmond Tutu once said, we have an extraordinary God. God is a mighty God, but this God needs you. When someone is hungry, bread doesn't come down from heaven. 
When God wants to feed the hungry, you and I must feed the hungry. And now God wants peace in the world. And we'll come back more to peace in a couple of weeks in the Prince of Peace title. You know, we can also have our own expectations challenged by God and how we think our story is going to go next or what we think we ought to be doing. The scripture teach us, teaches us that few things go as expected where God is at work. And during this season, I pray that may we open our lives to the unexpected work of God's Spirit and have the courage to follow this Messiah, calling us into uncharted waters, but still we follow, and there in the midst of storms and maybe chaos, we will find the peace of Christ to guide us and to sustain us from within to where he's calling us to go. Amen. Let's stand together, please, as we sing, Hark the Herald, Angels Sing. As our offertory people come forward, let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you have given us, especially during this Advent season. Let us look forward to the coming of the Christ child and to Jesus in the future. We lift up to you those that are in need, those who are fearful, as we know you've told us to fear not. We lift up those that are ill and ask for your healing touch and comfort to the family and wisdom to those that are ministering to them. As we go through this next week, Lord, help us to know that you are walking with us and help us to follow rather than try to lead. For it's in your name we pray, amen.
We have church council meeting this afternoon at four, so if you are the representative from a committee or team, please make sure that you are there. We didn't get to have it in November because we didn't have enough people to show for that time. So please be there this afternoon. Uh, out in the, uh, to the side of the Welcome Center, there's a table there with boxes that you can drop Christmas cards in if you would like to give a Christmas card to someone. Um, that's a great way to do that. If you want to send one to someone who is homebound or so, if you need an address, make sure to call Erin in the office and she will help you with that. But uh, you can bring your cards in, save a few stamps, and uh, put those back there and we'll make sure that they get to the, to the right people. We have our regular handbells and ladies ensemble this week. Uh, don't forget the, about the offering Bruce mentioned. There's more information on the back panel of your bulletin there. And also, uh, many of you have been so generous and kind to bring in gifts for the children and family ministries. Tomorrow is the last day, and then they will be taken up to the uh, children's home to be uh, distri distributed there. So thank you for those who have helped with that. I hope that you have a good week. I think we're in for some more rain. We all heard that shower a while ago. Uh, take care and um, have a great week.